Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. We have our first harmonica player, player, harmonica player that New York and me slipped out from a long time ago uh, with Bob Corator. He's uh, one of the hottest harmonica players on the blues circuit. He's also got, he's a smart business guy. He's got a lot of different things going on, great work ethic. So he's gonna be a good guest and I'm really happy to have him. Uh, and I wanna thank our mutual friend, Sugar Ray for uh, connecting us. Thanks, Sugar. Uh, let me give you Bob's cliff notes on Bob, one of the most active and highly regarded blues harmonica players on the scene today. He developed his style from listening to many of the original pioneers of Chicago blues. Between his own releases and as a sideman for other artists, Bob's performed on over 100 records, 100 albums. He's worked with loads of guests actually we've had here on the show, including Bob Margolin, Dave Mason, Kid Ramos, Sugar Ray, and others. Uh, many of the albums Bob has played on were nominated for or are winners of various Handy, Grammy, Living Blues, Blues Music Award, and Blues Blast Music Awards. Bob is a non-singing blues harmonica player. And the things he's accomplished, honestly, are really a testament to his uh, sense of hustle and work ethic. And we'll unfold those slowly. Dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you, Craig. My honor. All righty. You grew up in Chicago. You first got into the blues when you heard Muddy Waters on the radio at age 12. How did that lead you to picking up the harmonica? Well, Muddy Waters is just one of those people that when you hear it, it's, it could be a lightning bolt in your life. From that point forward, that was my North Star. So uh, ah. I need to buy my first Muddy Waters record. So I rode my bicycle to downtown Wilmette to Paul's Record Music and picked up Muddy Waters Sail On. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I picked it up. I, when I put it on, I just couldn't believe how beautiful it was. And, of course, the harmonica on there with little Walter was just stunning. So I was hooked immediately. I thought that was just great. I'd always enjoyed the sound of harmonica and the various pop records and various places I would hear it. But hearing Little Walter and Muddy Waters was the pinnacle. You know, it's interesting because to this day, I can put on that record and still say it's my favorite blues record. Because it just... That's awesome. It, it just, it's as good as it gets. So I don't know how I got led to it, but I went right to the, the best it could get. So yeah, Muddy Waters, you know, leads to all good things, I'd say. Was 12 years old is young to be listening to blues music was like, were your parents into blues or musical household? Or? Well, at that point in time, FM radio was just getting going. And there's a rock station that played the song Rolling Stone by Muddy Waters, because that's where the Rolling Stones got their name from. And I heard that and I said, you know, that's the pure thing that I'm looking for in all this other music I've been listening to. But there it is in its purest form. And so I like, I want more of that. Let me get that. And so that that's so came cool. to be, but I'm sure it was because of the connection, the, the Rolling Stones getting their name from that particular song by Muddy Waters. Sure. How, okay. So you start playing harmonica at 12. How did your musical experiences progress from that point? Like how, what was your, what was the next steps in the process? Really, It was more a year later, you know, when I started playing harmonica. So I, okay. my brother had one, he gave it to me and that became something I was obsessed with once I, once I started playing it and I just loved it. And uh, what was your question again, Craig? How, like, how did that lead to like the next steps from that? Like, how did you start playing and how did, how did that, how did that all unfold? Well, for a year or so, I lost a lot of friends learning to play harmonica, <laughs> playing in the back of the school bus, all sorts of stuff like that. You know, people, uh, it was an annoyance rather than a, a music, uh, uh, experience. But, uh, you know, gradually I learned to coax some of the sounds out of that. And, uh, I, you know, used to jam whenever I could with different people in my high school and, and just really enjoyed the sounds. I was an avid record collector. I you know, was actively seeking out, you know, an education in this music any way I could get it. And so, uh, and also, you know, I lived right in the hotbed of where all that was. So there were shows that were coming to my high school. I saw the Sam Lay Blues Revival as probably my first show. I went at your high school. Yeah. That, that's so, wild. That's awesome. Muddy man. Waters played my high school gymnasium my senior year. Wow. It was, was that a common thing in the Midwest? Well, yeah, these were local bands in the Chicago area. So, <laughs> you know, in Northwest. Wow. Right by where I lived. And they had shows that you could go and, and they were all ages, of course. So, yeah, I was at one of the shows 
of the Hound Dog Taylor live album on Alligator. I was actually at that show. Um, Otis Rush played at Barrett College. Um, you know, down the street, there was a pizza place and Blind Jim Brewer used to play there every Tuesday. I mean, it was just stuff you could do. And you could go down to Maxwell Street and see all this real blues, big Walter Horton. Now, on top of that, if you went to see some of the popular rock acts, I remember um, seeing, uh, uh, seeing somebody where big Walter Horton was the the opening act for that rock act. I think it was Quicksilver or something like that. And they just went, no. Nope. Wow. So, uh, I mean, it was all around and it was just part of the, part of the mix, you know, at that point in time, we're talking early seventies at that point in time, blues was changing its audience to kind of a young whiter audience. And so it was right. going to high schools and colleges and, being performed in various places. It wasn't until I got to be drinking age that I would go down to the south and west sides of Chicago. And at that point in time, I could, you know, go see Howlin' Wolf and go see little Walter's old band, The Aces, and see some of the stuff that you couldn't even believe, see Junior Wells over at Teresa's and things like that. So it's, uh, yeah, I was right in the hotbed. of Somehow I, I landed in the right place in life. You know, so yeah, uh, and I fell in love with the right stuff. I had a great appreciation for the old school. I could see that the the older generation was where where the masters were from, and sure, I just love those fifties recordings. And just was like, wow, there's a sound there that's just different than you can hear nowadays. So, wow, and and you're a hundred percent self taught. Well, y yes and no. I mean, being around Chicago and being at the the feet of the masters you know i mean i used to go see big walter horton every sunday over a blues that was harmonica church you know and yeah he would he, learn a little bit here and there you'd hang out with your harmonica buddies and everybody would be kind of sharing some information but a lot of what you learned initially was just by playing from the records there was a, a book that i got that actually dispelled the idea of a method called tongue blocking which i later came to to learn was the way that if you wanted to get that Chicago sound, you really had to go there. But initially this book kind of dispelled this idea, even though it was in the little brochures that they had on all the harmonicas that you would buy. They had these little little fold away things and you open it up and it would show you how to tongue block. And I go, well, it doesn't, seems a little awkward. But then when you learn how to tongue block, you go, oh, that's how they get that sound. You know, because you're putting your whole mouth over four holes and you're playing you're blocking three of the notes and that enables you to have all sorts of different effects, including like a percussive effect where you kind of slap into the note. It gives you certain types of tongue marbles and things like that, that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. And you're hearing this and, and as a non tongue blocker, I'm going, how did that happen? Then as a, once I changed over to tongue blocking, um, which a guy showed me at a big Walter Horton show. And I was like, well, okay, I've got a, spend all my energy, you know, making the transition to tongue blocking. So that became a big part of what I did. And once you have that sound, it's that sound. So having the sound, I think is a really important thing. And it's something that is so, it's so elusive to a lot of people. There's a lot of people that can learn all the notes and learn all sorts of techniques, but the older guys had a particular sound that I heard and I, I was like, how do I get there? So I spent a lot of years, you know, studying what it was, the, the tendencies, the, the, the kind of things that people would do that would create the Chicago sound. So that became part of who I am. Man, this is really interesting because I've never talked to a harmonica player, you know, like what you hear from guitar players or you know, bass players. It's a different process, a totally different process, obviously. But the focus on the tone, it's so interesting to hear that the same nuances of you know, harmonica exist with any other instrument, you know, as as why wouldn't it? But I, it's just my first time hearing it. So this is really cool. Thank you. But good education for me. It's different because it's really an extension of, of your physicality and your voice. So no two harmonica players have the same tone. Because our, you know, our jaw structure, our physicality, our lung capacity, all that is different. And every our vibrato, our ability to, to loosen up our neck and be able to get a good vibrato, all that's 
different. You know, nobody has the same exact way that they do that. And that gives individuality to each of the performers of that instrument. Awesome. That's really cool. Thank you for telling me this. You, you, so you get in this education, but then you took a break from music and you went to college at University of Tulsa where you got a degree in business. What prompted you to go to college and leave music behind for a while? That's not a common thing. Well, you know what? Especially you had such the bug. Sorry, I mean, cut you off. You had such a bug. Well, Craig, it wasn't as if I ever left it. It's just that that was an okay. adventure in my life. You have to understand that when I was growing up, my parents didn't have it in mind for me that I would be a musician. So this sure. I had to come to terms with at a later point in time in my life. I thought this was something I love and I wanted to pursue. But at the same time, uh, to have a full-fledged career, and it was something that I had to come to terms with later. And it was against what my parents had planned for me. And, you know, I grew up in an Italian family. You know, the, the parental structure is very strong. And so you, you think that you're supposed to do this. And but you know, while I was going to college, it wasn't like I put it behind because at that point I took the Chicago that I had learned and I put it to use in the clubs in Tulsa. Okay. University of Tulsa, which was, you know, such a different culture than the one I had grown up in. But right. I in town that could play Chicago style harmonica. And so I worked a lot with a lot of the guys that were older. You know, and so I, I had this dual life of college student and then nightclub musician at night. And it was kind of, I don't think many people would have that dual kind of uh, uh, lifestyle that was going on. So it was it's yeah. cool to do that. You know, meanwhile, I was, you know, making money playing gigs and I was building up my album collection and, you know, all of the things that would la lead to later on stuff. And every time I was on a break, I would just fill my my soul with as much knowledge as I could every night I was at the blues clubs and I take all this stuff and I put it to work in Tulsa where I was able to, to put it on the bandstands. So, and that kind of set me up for a lot of different things. And yeah, I still have some Tulsa roots and some friends in Tulsa and I can talk about the old days in Tulsa with a few people. So it's, it's pretty cool. You know, it was, it, Tulsa really accepted me and, and helped me along my path. Were you a first generation American or your parents from here? Like, did your parents come from Italy? My, my grandparents came from, from. Okay. 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 So your parents are first generation American and then, then you came. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I understand what you're saying. You know, growing up in the Bronx, there was like our fair share of Italians there, obviously. And, you know, I, I get it with the structure and the expectations of, you know, immigrant families. It's a totally different thing than, you know, uh, than generations of born in the States. I totally get that. How did, how did your parent, how did you ultimately like break it to them or like, Hey, this is what I'm going to do. How did that go down? I have a, a talk with them, you know, and they accepted it. But I mean, it, the interesting thing is after I moved from, I know I'm kind of probably going in front of all this, but after I moved to, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, which I thought was only going to be for a year. I thought I'd do a little chill from Chicago and and um, and and just see another part of the, the country for a minute. My brother lived uh, in – my brother John lived in Phoenix, and he invited me out. So oh, cool. I came out, and shortly after that, I was followed by Louisiana Red, who I had met at the Delta Fish Market. He was staying in Chicago at the time. And we had exchanged numbers after performing together. And uh, he uh, called me up and said, Bobby, where are you at? I said, well, I'm in Phoenix now. I just moved. He says, well, I know a woman out there. I was thinking about going there. I go, well, if you do, let me know. Let's get some gigs. Little did I know, a few weeks later, Red would show up, and he's over at <laughs> Davis's house. Eunice was a performer that lived in Phoenix, which I didn't even know at the time, lived in Phoenix. And so we're making plans for some gigs. Well, a week later, uh, Eunice calls me up and says, I just kicked Red out, come pick him up. And next thing you know, I, I had a, a roommate, my brother and I, <laughs> of our family, which uh, Red stayed with us for a year, went off on a tour, and then would meet his wife and stay in Germany. But that one year was so, uh, I don't know, so many things happened. 
uh, so many changes in myself happened. I didn't even realize, but part of it I was around this person who in the most pure of ways loved blues so much. And being around that was, uh, it took me to where he was at. And, you know, it was something so powerful that I couldn't, I couldn't deny it. And I realized that I had to do this because I was fooling myself thinking I could do a day job and play music, but really playing music was all that I wanted. So I did have the meeting with my parents and I said, I, this is what I need to do. And this is how you raised me to, to be true to myself. And they had to go along with me. They said, Bob, we only want you to be happy, but we want you to be financially secure. And we worry about this as a future for you. So anyway, so that's a good story. And another interesting story, Craig. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, this is good. Keep, man, dude, this is great. Good. No, so when I was going to college and I would, I used to hang out with like Coco Taylor and, and her band and she let me sit in with the band. And at one point, Pop said, you know, we're thinking about adding another member to the band and we want you to come to this re rehearsal and, and, and uh, see how it fits. And so I get a, a a time I still have like the he gave a, a little uh, one of those uh, note cards to uh, to Coco. She wrote her name and phone number. And I still have that. Yeah, you know? that's cool. Yeah, you know, but anyway, so I tell my parents I had this great opportunity and I wanted to go. And they're like, oh no, you cannot borrow the card to go to this thing. And I was so embarrassed. it was like, but yeah, you know, I probably wasn't ready to go on the road and you know just be a youngster that probably would not have been the right path me at that time but it right something that embarrassed me so terribly that i i like avoided coco taylor after that for a while because i just felt so embarrassed that i couldn't follow through on that but uh, wow years later you know we probably had to chuckle about it and years later it was important for me to to kind of have the full circle so i would take coco taylor into the recording studio and we would knock out a couple numbers which like the full realization of the dream that didn't happen before that finally got to happen. So that must have been great. I mean, you must have felt great doing that. It was, it was important for me to do that. Yeah. It, it was, that's cool. Yeah. So I, I didn't get to it right away, but I did get to it and I got a business degree at university of Tulsa. So, which has also helped me out because, you know, I run a nightclub and I run my, my band stuff as a business. So, you know, you get a different sense of things after you've, been through that kind of uh, schooling so let me ask you this it seems like you were in the right you were in the right place at the right time for what needed to happen for you to, in your life to give you like that level of fulfillment okay and even when you went to phoenix then it came to you so that's a pretty compelling you know that's the universe is like you know hey man you know, you really need to do this. How do you look at those events? Do you look at them as just random luck, serendipity, uh, higher power, you know, God? What's just when things fall into place like that? How do you look at that? I, I, I say prayers every day and I say prayers of thankfulness. I say prayers of questioning what I should do. I say prayers of of trying to be fulfilled, all of the things like that. And um, when I don't know what I'm supposed to do, I say, all right, it's in your hands, God. So right. me the way and inevitably some path develops, you know, and sometimes right. things will happen that are hardships or somebody's on your case or something that is hurtful to you. And you have to find your way through that in a way that keeps everything dignified and positive. And so, you know, things like that have been challenges occasionally, but Overall, you know, I mean, I, I've always said that, that God puts you exactly where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. And so was I ready for things to happen quicker than they happened? Probably not. So things happened as I was able to accept them. And you have to understand yeah. there, there's a lot of humility that has to happen when you're around the greatness that I've been around. You mm. have to understand that you're a small part of that. What can you contribute to some of the great masters that I've been able to, to, to be on the stage with or be in the studio with. And, and so I try and find a way to, to honor the artists that I admire so much through my activities. And I think that that's very important, but you can see how initially I, I was just so humbled being in, in 
the same room as some of the greats. Sure. But then ironically, at a point in time, you realize that you also have a marketing value and that maybe adding your name to the equation will help sell CDs. And maybe you're the guy hustling CDs, so you have to go and do all this. So it's it, it's it's been a balancing act as time goes on. You know, there's not a lot of those guys left and the legacy of these recordings kind of shows the worthiness of my activities. So I I like to think that they're they're valid and they're spiritual and they're justified in all those ways. That's cool, man. Thank you for sharing that. Where did you get that attitude of like of service? You know, that's as a young person to have that mindset of, hey, man, how can I serve this legacy? And, you know, that's a that's not very, you know, it's not very common for a younger person to have that attitude. I don't know. I mean, there's just such greatness in front of me. You know, you go see yeah. Horton or Junior Wells or Jimmy Rogers or all these people and you just saw all this stuff and as a fan of their records. Uh, from the fifties and you saw them, you know, move into it. There's something really beautiful about the blues too, where it was a common man's music where maybe some of these people didn't have the rock star qualities, but they got on the stage. They were the coolest people in the, the world. You know, somebody might still be in their waitress uniform and get up on the stage and all of a sudden be the goddess. And they're right. a, a more beautiful, sexy woman in the room than that person giving you her soul. And she might not be yeah. the best person to look at, but boy, she gave you so much of herself that you fell in love. And that was the power of the blues. I saw that regularly, that it was regular people music, you know. And then the whole black culture thing as somebody who didn't grow up into it, you know, when I first went to see Holland Wolf over at the 1815 Club, and I'm the only white, me and my buddy are the only white people for miles around. And I found the acceptance and uh, enthusiasm of my enthusiasm. People were responding to how much I love the music. And, you know, I was like, oh, oh we're having a, a birthday party. Come get some fried chicken and some potato salad and, and some greens over here at the table. And oh, I'm full. Well, you're welcome. If you get hungry later, come on by. You know, just the kindness of black culture and the acceptance of black culture was a, a beautiful thing to see. And I, you know, I was like, okay, this is a lesson that I need to incorporate into my daily life. Yeah. Uh. That's cool, man. It sounds like you really, uh, a, a good chunk of your personal development actually occurred in, in the midst of all these experiences. Well, you think about it, I was 25 years old when I moved to Phoenix and Louisiana Red followed me. And for the first time in my life, I was responsible for another human being that would have been in a bad way without my help. And, you know, we became, yeah. you know, my brother, my girlfriend and, and Red and I, we, you know, we, made sure everybody had enough food. We went to church every Sunday. We did all the good stuff. And Red, who was an orphan, never forgot that. That was really, wow. that was a real powerful thing for him to be, to have a family, you know, with us. And mm -hmm. Red went off to, to Germany and we kept in touch by, by letters. But then at a point in time, uh, he started coming back and touring the United States because there wasn't a lot of interest for a long time. But then ironically a bunch of interest happened that's another story but um but red would come and spend every year he would spend a month in the in the united states and he'd save the last week to spend with me in phoenix and oh have, that's nice man we'd have a night of dinner we'd do some recording sessions we'd have a friday and saturday night at the club and then he would be on my radio show um on the sunday and co-host it and play music and play uh, we play some of the music he loved and it was it, yeah it was just a great week you know whenever red was there and there's something that was so close between red and i that it was it was just a joy to be around him and if things were a little bit off balance just being around red there was just this undeniable kindness and love that would come from him that would always rebalance me so dude that's so nice to hear yeah it was that's awesome a beautiful experience knowing Red. Another, some other things about Red is the first gig I ever booked. Eunice actually booked the first gig in Phoenix, but the first gig that I ever booked was at this club on Indian School Road called the Purple Turtle, which later would be the Rhythm Room. Your club? Yes. And wow. <laughs> I ever went to the radio station that I've been a DJ on for now, 
39 years. <laughs> First time I ever went there was Louisiana Red invited me to join him. He was going to do a on-air performance and an interview. So he invited me to join him. I became aware of the station through that. So when Red so he he was like the genesis of a lot of things that became pretty important in your life. Yeah, he the first time years later he would invite me to the King Biscuit Blues Festival, which I've been a regular participant in for for all the years since. Um, he um, but no, he he was this guardian angel and yeah in, in ways I didn't even know with him in my life. And when he came back to the United States and got to be on the radio station and got to go to the club that we used to have. He was like a pop, proud big brother. He was so happy. Right. He's like, well, Bobby owns the club. Bobby has a radio show now. You know, it's just, it was a, you know, a fulfillment for him as well as for me to be able to do yeah. that. So. That's awesome. That's a very good story, man. Uh, in 1979, you started producing and you also started a label called Blues on Blues Records. How did those things come about and what did you get out of that experience of initially producing and running a label? Because they're not, neither one of them is easy. Okay. Okay. And let's get back into the context of that moment. So sure. fresh out of college, I um, loved harmonica and I loved the, the elders of harmonica and I admired um, so many of the cool recordings that were coming out that would maybe bring light to some of the lesser known artists. And so I, I wanted to, to do that for myself. I wanted to make a mark in this world. And so I, I decided I wanted to, to invest in that particular path. And uh, so I put together first a, an album by, uh, Little Willie Anderson, who was Little Walter's valet and played very much in the, the the later part of Little Walter's style. Little Walter had a number of styles throughout his career, but this was the later, more jagged, staccato part of Little Walter's phrasing. And Little Willie knew exactly how to, to, to do all that stuff. So without any real experience, but with the help of some great people like Steve Wisner and Dick Sherman, and later on, as far as the business part, Bob Kester of Delmark Records, um, and Jim O'Neill, of course, of Living Blues Magazine. Uh, I put together this session, and also I got to mention Rob Hecko over at Blues, who gave me a rehearsal space for free, all sorts of things that happened like that. But I went into the recording studio in 1979 with Little Willie Anderson, and somehow it turned out that I was able to get some of the greatest uh, Little Walter Band alumni, and part of that was just serendipity because, uh, sadly, Lee Jackson had just died and Robert Lockwood was in town for the funeral. So at the very last minute, literally the day before the session, I added him to this whole thing. And then Freddie Bilo got added on. You know, and so all of a sudden I have this group of ex-Little Walter players in the studio with this guy who played in that style. And they all were basically living that the extension of the sound that they had created. And quite frankly, I knew nothing about producing. I just was in there and I just, I had an idea, but I didn't have much of an idea. And between these great musicians with like Freddie Bilo and Robert Lockwood, they would kind of coach me through it as well as Dick Sherman and Steve Weisner had done this before. And then, uh, Jim O'Neill was there to take photos, and it was uh, it was kind of an interesting thing. So, all of a sudden, I put out this first record, and and then a few years later, I I worked on a record with uh, with Big Leon Brooks, another great harmonica player, and I was able to really get the crumb the la crumb, you know, the top shelf Chicago blues guys to play on these sessions, and I'm like, oh okay, this is accessible to me. I can do this. So yeah, I mean, it taught me a lot. And the second thing that I did, I had much more of a sense of how to produce after going through it one time. And so, and I continue to grow as a producer to this day. You know, you learn to do more and more things and have your way with, you know, how to arrange a session and how to produce it and how to get the, coax the best out of the people that you're recording. But um, I think I did pretty good to start out with. So, um, yeah, you think about 
starting out at age, uh, you know, however old I was, maybe uh, 22, I guess I was, or something like that. 20, uh, and all of a sudden I'm um, in the studio with Robert Lockwood and Louis Anderson and Freddie Bilo and Jimmy Lee Robinson, Sammy Lawhorn. And you're going, okay, now this is, I mean, that's a, a pretty high place to start. Yeah. So, and, and to yeah. say that, that record's kind of a little bit of a underground cult record among both guitar players and harmonica players, because, it, you know, it's one of those. What's it, what's it called? It's called Little Willie Anderson Swinging the Blues. And okay. Pitwick Records would later put it out on CD. It came out on my record label. Now, now Craig, I have to say that after, after trying to be a record label and dealing with distribution who gave you no respect unless you were like a bigger label and had regular releases they weren't going to pay you until they needed your next release i was like okay i hate that part of the business i really hated it and but i love producing but i hated all of that so i kind of under, i got to dissect what i enjoyed and what i didn't enjoy so um and my expectations changed because i realized this was not a business where you were actually going to really make money it was like everything else in blues a labor of love but right right but i i got some great experience and that really set a template for how i was going to live the rest of my life because i always valued how sacred and uh, a recording was you know obviously i heard that great muddy waters song from the late 1940s that changed my whole life and so i realized that a, a recording could last forever and it's just this this beautiful thing that that will last long beyond my lifespan it will it'll be there so i i've always taken that sacredness of recording as, as a really high level thing to to accomplish so uh, anyway but that was the start of my recording you know, and I was like, okay, well, this is how it's done. So it gave me, uh, I didn't have the fear of it since I started out recording some of the highest level people. Yeah. But it took me a little while before I felt that I was worthy of including my own self in certain recordings, you know, because I had, I had some learning to do, you know, sure. I mean, through the whole process of all this, I'm still learning. I'm still, you know, refining what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, getting better and, and more expressive. I'm learning how to be me as a harmonica player. You know, you, obviously you latch onto your heroes and the sound of your heroes, but at a point in time, you take that all inside of you and you put it through your own soul filter. And then it comes out you at a point and you develop your own tone and all that stuff. So I continue to, to, to move in that direction of, of developing myself. So, I thought it was also really cool that your that enthusiasm you had, like to get other harmonica players in there even and produce them. You know, there was no, you know, that's not a common thing where like if a producer is a guitarist or, you know, whatever they are, they don't necessarily want to get another one of them in there. You know, they want to, you know, they want to get other people and they want to just insert themselves like kind of what you just said. I thought it was really pure. The purity of that was nice to hear and see that, you know, hey, man, I had these guys. You just you just wanted to be around great musicians, you know, didn't care what what they played. Well, you know, when you're around some of the older school people, there's lessons you can learn and oh, relationships yeah. that you can forge. You know, um, you know, Lil Willie Anderson, though, he was he was kind of um, uh, he's kind of a ball buster, you know, but he 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 really appreciated what I had done for him and he didn't show it a lot, but in my last conversation with him, he, he really thanked me for it all in a very reflective conversation. On sports. That's nice. That's cool. Uh, very cool. Big Leon Brooks. When I recorded him, he, I took him down over to my place, played him the test pressing with, uh, with, uh, my, my nice stereo and whatnot. And he just thanked me. He said, Bob, I never thought I could make music like this. And he showed this to me. And I'm really, you'll always be my brother for this. And so, I mean, things like that, that you can yeah. accomplish that are, you know, they're wonderful milestones. Oh, what? It, yeah. How do you measure the value of the meaning of an interaction like that? Yeah. yeah. And these are people that yeah. I love and that I learned a lot from that showed me certain tricks on harmonica and technique. And, you know, I, 
I'd like to think that I take a little of them with me wherever I go. All right. What were some of your challenges early on as far as, you know, so even at a young age, you have your hands in a lot. You you have your playing career, you have production, record label. How, what were some of the challenges as far as getting things moving? And how did you manage to even focus at, at that young of age to, you know, prioritize, okay, this is what I need. This is what, you know, the record business needs this. My production needs this studio needs this. You know, I got a couple of gigs here. I got to, you know, how did you manage all that? It's not easy. I, I think um, maybe like obsession would be a better word for it. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, man. I, that's, 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 that's I was driven to go in that direction. And, you know, if I had, some time to spend on me, that's where I would spend it. I'd go to a record store, I'd go to a blue show, or I'd study on my harmonica, things like that. So yeah, I just wanted to to follow the path of that music. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. But yeah, it, so, it took a while to get to a point where I was comfortable with my role in all of this. So it's, uh, yeah, I was a student when I was in Chicago. I looked at that. Yeah. I remember the first gig I did that I felt, I mean, I used to sit in with a lot of people, but to be hired to play in somebody's band was a whole different level. And uh, Willie Buck was the first guy to do that. And we did a South Side gig and I show up for work and it's Lewis and Dave Myers, who both were part of the Aces, which were Lil Walter's backing band. Um, Elmore James, old drummer, which is Odie Payne Jr., Big Moose Walker, who played with Earl Hooker and, and so many other people. And then Byther Smith was the second guitar player. And I'm up here with these heavyweights. And Lewis and I were friends. I used to pal around with him and, you know, just hang on to every word. He'd tell a little Walter story sometimes after a gig. So I'd known him uh, in a number of different roles. I, we were friends, but I had never, like, done a gig with him. And I said, Lewis, I don't know if I'm supposed to be up here with you all. He says, you play and you play and go on. You know, and Lewis, who's a great guitar player, also is an amazing harmonica player. So, you know, I'm sitting there. And then afterwards, we're partying afterwards till the sun rises. And I'm, I'm, I'm in the band, you know. I'm, That's so cool. You know, so it's like, okay, this is, this is like the full thing. Right, right. But then again, the re the the dream realization is now being realized. Yeah, but then again, yeah. the other part of it, and this is part of why I moved to Phoenix, is that you know, I might be making, I might be making twenty um, five bucks or something for a gig, you know, and it wasn't enough to live on, obviously. <laughs> right. Outside gigs in in poor neighborhoods. So, what could you really expect from living the dream? And that was right. a conundrum for me. And at the same time, I had just quit drinking at age 24. And I'm like, oh, let me go chill out with my brother for a while and just let me try and put things in perspective. Because, you know, without the, the little extra buzz of the alcohol, you find yourself in these situations that are, you know, a little touchy at times. So you're going, okay, that was close, but I got by. But how many more of those would I get, you know? So. Uh, could we, so have you not drank since then? No. Are you, are you comfortable? Could we talk about that for a minute? Sure. I mean, well, I never, what made you, I, I, sorry, drinking was a social thing for me. I right. felt a dependence on it. I have other friends that it, they had to go to, a, you know, um, AA meetings and stuff for a year. Sure. I just woke up one day and I had terrible hangover and it was the second week in a row I had a terrible hangover. I said, why am I doing this? This will take me away from what I love to do. It's taking my yeah. I just quit. I just made this. That's awesome, man. But I don't know that everybody can do that. Some people find a dependence on it. I just never was that type of person. So I just quit like that. And I never looked back. So that's great. But it, but it, you know, it was a another change of life. But I, if like if I'm serious about what I want to do in life, let me let me be serious about it. Let me not let this stupid thing get in the way you know but when growing up when i grew up drinking was just a, a social ritual that people did and sure and it was fun for a while but then it wasn't fun and i'm like, okay why would i continue it was with? fun for a while until it wasn't <laughs> yeah. but, uh, at what expense is it fun you know it, yeah 
you know, it just wasn't wasn't good. So yeah. Next. Well, power to you, man. That's awesome. Um, how did you get the mayor of Phoenix to name September 29th Bob Core Tour Day? That's pretty pretty cool. Well, I had really zero to do with that, but <laughs> there's some friends of mine that were really, you know, I, I have a lot of friends and fans that really love me and, and what I contribute to my community. And so they went, uh, well, one person in particular went and rallied for me and got the, <laughs> got the, uh, uh, you know, got a number of actually certificates for me from various government officials. So it was, you know, an honor. Uh, they named a day Bob Corridor Day. And so I, I was really honored. They presented to me at a birthday party I was throwing. And I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. I have my own day now. So, yeah, that is pretty cool. I've never, I haven't, I don't think I've spoken to someone who has their own day. That's awesome. Well, yeah. And I haven't spoken, and you're the first person to use the North Star expression, which is another thing that was okay. cool. 900 interviews. That's, that's good. Well, so, anyway, so Craig, so that there's this great day at a party. The next day, I was completely tired. And uh, I go, well, I guess today's just not my day. <laughs> was, it was a show. No, hey. <laughs> right. Today is not your day. Yes. Do, do, so there's like a, a thing now, like every September 29th, is it like a, well, according to in like a birthday sort of a thing or kid, it's just that one day, that one year. So, oh, okay. Fired. But on September 29th, sometimes I'll, I'll post a I remember I'll go happy Bob Corridor Day and I'll post a certificate, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Dude. You know, I mean, it's all sweet. It's all motivated in positive things. I don't know if you read that, but it's like um, Bob Corridor for bringing artists into his rhythm room. And this helps um, the hotel taxes that that he's helped, you know, all these different things and doing a radio show and, you know, all the stuff that I've done to, I guess, bear a day. So um, I thought it was kind of cool. So. It's very cool, man. Mention your radio show. So in 84, you started a five. You know what I like about you, man? You don't do anything half-assed. You don't like do, <laughs> you know. No, I like that because that's, you know, that's you, you're true to yourself and you're like, you, you don't, you know, half-ass anything. It's it's better. Uh, so you, you don't just start like a half-hour talk show. You just start a five-hour, <laughs> a five-hour weekly blues radio show called Those Low Down Blues. Tell me about the show. How did it come about? And and maybe like what was some of your cool experiences that you've gotten out of that? Okay. So, Craig, uh, the uh, show initially started as a one-hour pre-recorded show. Okay. First year, then the program director said, Bob, we want to move you to Sunday nights and we want to expand your show. And so that just happened. And all of a sudden I had to learn how to be on live radio. And I'll never forget when I'm being trained, you know, there's a jazz DJ and they train me and uh, the guy leaves the room and I have to press the on button. All of a sudden it just seemed like an eternity from the moment I, the, the microphone was on until the moment I spoke. But, <laughs> and I'm going, um, 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 yeah, what you do when you, <laughs> and that's how it, goes. but I've been doing it for so long. It's like, I feel like I'm in my living room, you know, yeah. albums that I love and playing for people. That's kind of how I look at my radio show. I get to spend five hours with the music that I love. It's very much a historically based show. It's very much, um, centered on more of the vintage recordings, some new releases, but really more just the just the, the 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 roots of it all the historic roots and where it all came from where it led to you know so i enjoy hmm. comparisons and through the radio show i've learned a lot you know it's like oh okay i want to do a special on so and so let me purchase this album that album and and, and this and learn more about this artist so after all these years i'm still educating myself uh, to some of the great musicians that are out there and it just keeps expanding. So it gives me, I think a fairly good range of stuff. You know, obviously I play not only blues, but all the tributaries, some of the, you know, uh, I, I play like great deep gospel music or soul music or, you know, Zydeco music or boogie woogie piano, different things that are blues or in the blues family, but they might be kind of the tributaries of the river. 
you know, that, sure. that runs through it. You know, some of the, the great uh, jazz musicians made great blues things. So sometimes I'll do a set of that. You know, we featured some great uh, Jimmy McGriff. I just played a cool Hank Crawford song. Of course, Hank played with Ray Charles and Ray Charles was hard to define, but I, I say he always had one foot in the blues. So what, oh, yeah, whatever definitely. he sang, he could say, blues, gospel, soul. Every, yeah. yeah. But that's all, I think it's all connected. That's all part of the yeah. whole of the, the music. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming from is let's, let's get as close as we can to that particular feeling of that beautiful soul that comes out in those songs. So. Can people, I'm sure people listening to this would love to check it out online. Is this available to stream online and, and how would people listen to it? Yes, it's only available um, in real time. And so Sun. Mm -hmm. Mountain Standard Time, which again we don't have daylight savings time in uh, in Arizona, but it, basically Arizona time five hours from six p.m. to eleven p.m. Sunday nights. So depending on what your time zone is, that's going to be a different time for you. But somewhere in there, you'll be able to uh, to enjoy my offerings on the radio. And people would look up those low down blues, or they look up the radio station. So it would What's be the best way to get e j z z dot org. So basically, k j z z. It's we call it K Jazz. Okay, cool. But there's no A in it. So awesome. So k j z z dot org. Sunday nights six to eleven. That's awesome. Yeah, and in, in February of uh, twenty twenty four, the show will be forty years old. That's amazing, man. Wow, that is amazing. Congratulations. That's awesome. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. So, Yeah, yeah, I know the feeling. And if I'm touring, I always have to pre-record the shows. So it's like you really have to. Oh, shit, that's a lot of work. Yes. To have to... Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, so you released your first album as an artist. In 1999, when you were 43, that must have felt great. It felt like it was my time to finally do that. And we, uh, there were 12 years of recording sessions. So I could have had something done before, but both my parents were, who had moved to Arizona were not in good health. And my dad died in uh, 94 and my mom in 90. Sorry, man. So, but... During that time period, I just didn't feel like putting out an album and seeing where that could take me would be appropriate. So I waited until it was my time. And uh, I think that was a good move. That was something that was what I needed to do. Um, and then it's like, okay, well, it's my time now. So I put out this record, and I think it, it holds up as a, a pretty darn good record still today. Um, People didn't know what to do with it because you know, my friends in Chicago remember me as the Chicago, you know, blues nerd. And they're like, oh, I can't imagine having an album out by this guy, even though I like this album. <laughs> the rejection letters I had were very sweet. <laughs> and it took it took records which <laughs> well above all the others. I mean, Bruce Bromberg, who we lost a few years back, sadly, was a great man and Larry Slovin. But they were there in it for the, the music. And this was the record label that had um, Robert Cray and Joe Lewis Walker in the blues. Also had people like Alvin, Jimmy Dale Gilmore, all these wonderful artists on their record label. And they were truly the Americana record label long before that term ever even existed. But sure. their hearts were in such a beautiful musical place. And they heard this record and they believed in it. And they were, they put it out. And all of a sudden, I have this record out. People go, this is a pretty darn good record with all these great artists, but who the hell is Bob Corator? You know, <laughs> you know who I was. And, you know, some people had a hard time with it initially and, until they got used to it. And I had a hard time initially with this. Like, oh, God, what do I do with this now? I didn't know. You know, I didn't know the next step of, like, touring and different things like that. It would take some years after that before I could put all the other elements in place. So I, I was... Strictly, uh, you know, a Phoenix or a regional artist occasionally doing some dates in California or Colorado or maybe Chicago when I come go back to visit. But people didn't really know me that way. They they knew me in a different way. They, they wanted to uh, in the United States, people wanted to to put you into one category and then you could yeah. another category. 
So if I'm a, a DJ, I'm a DJ. If I'm a club owner, I'm a club owner. If I'm a musician, then I'm a, either all a musician, but I can't do all these things. Sorry, you can't occupy all these spaces. So it wasn't until... It's weird like that. I don't know why. But Europe was a whole different deal. And when I went over to Europe yeah. um, in the, the mid-2000s uh, for the first time, uh, they embraced that as like a, a renaissance man in the blues. And I found yeah. acceptance and um, encouragement that I never found in the United States. And I was like, oh, okay, there's a market for who I am and what I'm trying to do. And I'm putting together these cool little, you know, underdog bands, these scrappy bands that nobody's ever heard of. And I'm I'm winning audience. And that's a really powerful thing. I'm going, okay, yeah. that just gave me extra charge to put out records and to do all sorts of things like that. And all of a sudden I saw more of a value in who I was. And I go, uh, I, I go to Europe and next thing you know, I'm being featured in an article in, in a European publication. And I played the Cognac Blues Festival and there's this uh, thing called uh, Collective uh, Des Radios Blues. And they gave me an honorary title as their blues godfather. <laughs> That's really So here you're like 50 and you start hitting the road internationally. That is so wild. That's so cool, man. Good it, for you. It's an interesting journey, you know. Um, but like I said, I think God puts you where you're supposed to be exactly when you're supposed to be there. I, yeah. You know, it, it leaves you with a certain humility. I mean, if somebody gets all this early on, what do they do after that? For me, I've taken the time. I've earned it. I've I've been happy in the role of of the service of other people for a lot of years, Craig, I was afraid I felt unworthy of putting my name in with the elders, you know, but then right. the time I realized that I'm the guy that was going to sell those records. And if, if I'm not around booking the gig with this person, I could still sell it for my name and photos on there. And I wanted right. you to put out records. So I realized that I created a, you know, a marketing, uh, image for myself that people were relating to. I'm like, okay, well, let's take this and let's use this to help channel some of the great artists that I'm able to work with. You know, let's, let's take this, this platform I've created and use it to help a Dave Riley or, a, or a Henry Gray, who are artists that had more history and, and, and their validity was unquestionable. Uh, but I, here's, little old me and I'm able to make these very cool records and produce them to the best of my ability and I think make some of the best work that they ever did and put it out there and then have my name on it as a little extra seal of 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 attraction to the to the buyer so that was an interesting place to come to terms with it took me a while to 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 feel all right about that because you know how do you compare my small little contributions to somebody like Henry Gray, who played on all these classic Chicago blues records in the fifties that helped form who I am. But Henry was totally cool with it. And we loved each other and we loved traveling together. And as he got older and we, we were touring well into his nineties, you know, he looked, Oh my God. Yeah. He died at age 95 and he, he was uh, touring until he was 92. And then we still did gigs in Louisiana where people would want me to to fly in and rent the car and take Henry where he needed to go because Henry trusted me and I'd looked out for him and it just that was kind of what had to happen. So, and he died a little bit after his 95th birthday and I went flew to Baton Rouge to wish him 95. But he had withered to just almost nothing at that point. But it was, mm. it was beautiful to see him one last time. And the nurse got him up and he did the best he could to play some piano and you know neither of us wanted to let each other go and we shook hands goodbye. So and, yeah, that's gotta be heart, heartbreaking, but let's move on or we'll start crying about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, talk about the vault series. Cause you've done a really smart thing with that. And it's what you just alluded to where you have, a, you know, formed partnerships, friendships, musical, great relationships where you can showcase these people and you do it in a really cool way. So talk about how that came, how you came up with that and, you know, where that has taken you. Well, okay. In, uh, 
1991, we opened up the Rhythm Room. And I got the call at a point in time. It's one of those moments where I'm like, okay, I don't know where I'm supposed to go, so I'm just leaving this in God's hands. And I get this phone call, and it's like, hey, Bob, I'm a fan of your radio show. I've been reading about you, and I own this club. It used to be called the Purple Turtle. It's been had a couple of owners since then. And I think I'm, I'm thinking about doing the unthinkable, developing a, a blues bar, a business on there. And I'm wondering if you'd, if I could meet with you and we could talk about that. And I go, this seems like this could be the, the ticket. <laughs> so <laughs> next thing you know, I'm in this business uh, and, and I took to it. I, 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 with this guy, you and this guy yeah, own the rhythm. Okay. The uh, de facto owner working for him, you know, but he, owned- okay. So, um, and, I took to it pretty easily and it was successful. And But as soon as I had this opportunity, I realized that I was gonna get a lot of people coming through and I should take that opportunity to to record. I was working with a guy named Chico Chisholm, Holland Wolf's last drummer. I had a great little house band. So sometimes we'd bring in artists and back them. Other times I'd have artists come with their band, but they'd come and do a few numbers with my band in the studio as a little extra gig. And so I was able to offer a gig and then another gig sometimes on the same day. And people were like, yeah, of course. So I was recording at a pretty strong level, sometimes like one session a month or something for a lot of years. I just had this abundance of different things and I was putting out some of it, but there's no way I could keep up with all of that at the level of production that I had at that point in time. And uh, you know, sometimes you'd grab the, the, the track that would mix the easiest that would maybe take the least amount of post-production to get it in, in the best form to put out. And then you just leave the rest and, you know, you just keep recording. And then this, this pile, this, this vaults became very deep with cool recordings that were of historic value, especially at points in time after some of these people have left us. And there was this mm. recorded thing that we had done together. And, you know, with a guy like Chico Chisholm, established blues veteran, oftentimes with it, sometimes with other great, players. I always kept really good bands. And I, I had in mind that the bands would need to be recordable. They need to be able to play of a purity and of a musical um, accomplishment enough to, to be worthy of recording. So I just, I always work with the best people. Um, and so um, during COVID, I'm sitting back and of course, how often in life, Craig, do we have the opportunity to stop the world and get off for a minute? Yeah. Bad, I, I, yeah. As bad as COVID was, it was a time of great reflection. It stopped. Yes. You had to look at things from a different lens. And also, you know, my dear friend Dave Riley, who I worked with for 15 years, um, he got COVID early on and was on a ventilator for three weeks. And during that time, he had a stroke. We hope. That oh, my God. Sometime. But right now, he's got no use of his left side, pretty much. And uh, oh man, I'm sorry to hear that. And then uh, we lost Paul Osher, Tomcat Courtney, um, Carol Fran, many people who I just love have been lost to that terrible disease. Four people had a vaccine. You now, wherever you stand on the side of vaccine, the, the people who have taken it, there's a sense that at least if you get it, you're not going to die. And mm-hmm. you know, who knows what the exact right thing is, is with all that, but I was very happy to take the vaccine and uh. Mm-hmm. Had five jabs so far, you know, just keeping up with all of the the newer version sure. of the vaccine. But but before all that happened, I'm sitting here in danger, afraid to, you know, I'm masking up, I'm doing whatever I can do to just keep myself alive and wondering what the next thing is. And so part of what I did is I'm like, well, if I don't get this vault stuff out now while I'm in my 60s, what am I do? Wait till I'm in my 70s and then. Right. Will I have the energy to do that? Will I have the focus to do that? Who knows? So I just I just made a, a pact to myself to, to get out some of the stuff that I've been meaning to get out for a lot of years. And uh, I have a great record label with Vistone, um, Vistone Label Group. And you know, I have, basically I have Southwest Musical Arts Foundation, which creates these records and then partners with Vistone Label Group who promotes and distributes it so I don't have to deal with the parts of the industry that I don't like. And Good. Uh, they were cool enough to say, yeah, we'll get behind you on this series. Now, this is a lot of work for the record label. They have to promote 
X amount of records, you know, and so, you know, I'm putting out, you know, this year I've got five releases, four of which are vaults and one will be a new release. And, you know, this time. That's it? Just five? <laughs> that's, that's a lot of work. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I know. I'm being, so, I'm being facetious. That's a ton of work. I, I'm not going to be able to keep up that pace forever. But, you know, this year I just, I got a bunch of stuff done and I'm really happy about it. And two of the releases are out so far. I've got one more vaults thing coming out in uh, next month in May. And then uh, in September, I'll have a new release. And then in December, I'll have the last vaults release. Awesome. Each of these have been. That's a lot of work. Thematic and, and pretty cool. Just, you know, the, the latest one that's out is Women in Blues Showcase. And I feature some of the great women I've gotten to work with. I got to put out some unreleased Barbara Lynn and Carol Fran and some Valerie June and some other really cool artists that are just, and you know, that the, the feminine voice is just such a powerfully expressive thing. And, and to be able to show a, a full album of, of women power is just spectacular, especially have it, have it come out during Women's History Month. So that's, sure. that's a pretty cool. That's cool. So, and then the next one will be a, a Chicago guys. It'll be called the High Rise Blues. And I'm not sure when this will air. Maybe it'll be out by the time this comes out. But High Rise Blues will be a collection of different Chicago artists, most of which were recorded in Phoenix, ironically. But there is a Coco Taylor that was recorded in Chicago. And there's, uh, but it's 14 all unreleased tracks. It's got Bo Diddley, Jimmy Rogers, Magic Slim and the Tears. Oh, wow. Perkins, John Brim, Eddie Clearwater, Sam Lay, the list goes on. You know, it's amazing how, uh, how you sort of work this out. Like, I think it's pretty clever that you said, Hey man, while you're in town, let's record a session or two here. I mean, and, and that you had the, and you weren't even sure why you were doing it. And then, you know, how this all worked out. I think that's really cool. Well, I knew I was doing it because I wanted to be close to this music that I, I just, that I just adore, you know, and that I find so important. And so to be able to record with Jimmy Rogers, you know, is a dream come true. And, and the way that worked out is uh, the, uh, the agent, Tom Rada, I said, okay, well, you can book Jimmy Rogers for a week, but you've got to pay him this amount for the week. And so I'd set it up with gigs and a recording session. So right. I'm, I'm recording with my hero. I remember being in high school and buying the record Chicago bound and playing it over and over again and going to bed at night dreaming about the songs on that record. And here I am performing with this artist. And through that whole experience, I'd met him and seen him many times in Chicago. But when you are touring and recording with Jimmy Rogers, there's a closeness that happened. And we were, we got to be really close friends through all of that. And it was great, you know, just being on the road with him and he'd tell these stories, Chicago Blues. I wish I had a tape player on, but he'd fill in all the blanks as far as the history. I could ask him questions about this guy or that guy. And he'd like, oh, okay. You know, some stuff that was like wrong, you know, that, that had been history that he like would correct. He said, well, actually that somebody said that and it kept, kept getting repeated, but that wasn't how it went down. And so this is how it is. I'm like, oh, okay, I've got a better sense of it all, you know, and you know, growing up in that area and knowing so many of the people from the seventies that were active in the fifties, you know, I got, I had a real good sense of like, I could kind of add the personalities to the stories. It was pretty cool. Did you come across or ever work with like Mike Bloomfield? This was later on, obviously, but did, did you ever do anything with him? I never did anything with him. Uh, I never met him. I did get to see him once at a Muddy Waters soundstage show that he was part of. It was a show all basically in tribute to Muddy and had Coco Taylor and Johnny Winter and, and uh, Junior Wells and Nick Grabnides and um, Michael Bloomfield was there. It was the one time I got to see him. But a, a little known fact is that uh, we went to the same high school together at different times. So, but oh, that's pretty wild. Never graduated high school. He knew what his calling was and he just immediately dropped out and went to the music thing. So, but. Oh. But he was actually, uh, him and Marshall Chess both went to the same high school I went to. Did you work with Nick Gravenitis? I mean, that guy's voice was just, I, I hear it to, 
today and I just stop what I'm doing. I, I can't say I actually worked work with him, but I did open a show for um, the uh, Chicago Blues reunion. And uh, they called me up to play and I did get to do some songs with Nick. I did get to perform with him. He was, you know, a beautiful singer and uh, yeah, uh, really cool. And, uh, and ironically, my old high school buddy uh, did like the, the out of the box records that made that record happen and helped to promote some of the tours and also has this uh, born in Chicago documentary that I think is making its way through film festivals now. It's been a number of years. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard about that. Yeah. There's another Bloomfield documentary too, and uh, I think I saw that as well. I'm sure that's great. Well, yeah, Mike yeah. really had his hand in a lot of stuff. You know, he was really out there doing interviews and promoting, and uh, he was part of that Fickle Pickle thing, which was before my time, but that was a, a North Side club that uh, brought in a number of, of blues artists and recorded them. So a lot of things happened because of Mike Bloomfield. He was part of before the Butterfield Blues Band and his fame and the Super Session fame and, and Electric Flag and all that. But before all that, you'd find him on, there's like a Sunnyland Slim uh, Swedish radio broadcast that came out on Blues Varker or something like that is the name of the album. And so he's playing beautiful guitar on that. He's playing on some James Cotton stuff. He's playing, you know, here and there. He's on a, a uh, he's on a, an, an album by Sam Lay, but uh, Sleepy John Estes, Hammy Nixon on Del Mar, he's on that. So he, you know, he had his hand in a lot of different things. He was very involved in that. And right. uh, he was, he had a vision also of, of how all of this should fit together and, uh, and pursued that. And then at the same time, created his own style. It was, you know, very high energy, uh, oh, just blues that, that, best. that would, uh, you know, really, translate well to people of his generation and, and the rock audience that was becoming the blues audience. So, you know, he, he did a lot of things for progressing this music along. I meant to ask you, Bob, what's the biggest challenge of owning a club? <laughs> it, it, it's like, I mean, it's there's so many moving parts. I don't know if you could answer that in one thing. Well, it's definitely a labor of love. And if, if I, if I wasn't so involved in all the other aspects of music, there's no way I would look at it as a business because we mm, okay. have months and we have some bad months, but we're always scuffling just to pay the bills. Anybody who thinks yeah. club owner is, is wealthy, no. But it is an enablement for me in that, I, you know, if you have a gig, you have a band. So I'm able to always keep a good band together. I'm able to bring in some of my artists. Uh, nowadays, there's less people touring, so sometimes I'll fly in different people to make – uh, you know, recording sessions. So I've got a birthday party coming up in September. I've got Bob Margolin and Anthony Jurassi and Wes Starr and Bob Strozier coming in. And I've got Oscar Wilson and, uh, and uh, Willie Buck coming in, you know, my first employer. So I get to return the favor years later. So that's cool. Um, but yeah, we just did a session with uh, a lot of the same players with John Primer coming in. We're working on our fourth album together it was just you know it was session was on fire i mean we did we accomplished nine fully realized songs in an afternoon and you know wow well like should we stop because we're tired but it's just working let's just keep going what the heck so that's a pretty productive day yeah and that's a third of <laughs> nine i've done three sessions for this album so far and uh I'll have plenty to choose from. So I've got oh, God, more yeah. than a great record. I'm going to have to figure out which ones I have to set aside for the next one. But that, that's a good problem to have. That is a good problem to have. But yeah, yeah. it was just on fire this last time. It's great. So, uh, but I think I lost track of what your question was, Greg. No, that was it. It was the biggest challenges of owning a club. You oh, said paying the bills oh, and keeping the doors open and, it, you know, just managing everything. Tough. And you have know, the COVID thing. It's terrible. Oh shit, that's right. Did you get it? Did you wind up getting COVID yourself? No, I'm I'm still a COVID virgin. Oh, that's good. But I'm really I'm not. <laughs> wear a mask when I'm I don't wear a mask at the club or at gigs, but I won't wear a mask pretty much every other place. And yeah. so people look at me like I'm weird, but I'm like, you know what? I have ninety two year old Bob Strozier coming into town or cut or am I doing be doing the last thing I want to do is even have the hint of being yeah. that or John Primer, who's, you know, in his seventies 
you know, yeah. some of these elder players, they might not be able to to do well with that. Yeah, although Bob Strosher, no, I get it. Bob Strosher had it twice and has survived it just fine. It's doing great, but still, you don't want to put any challenge, health challenges through. And no, not on a older guys like ninety guy ninety. That's definitely not. Well, yeah, yeah, you want to avoid that shit. Yeah, you've played for years, literally all over the world. What would you say are the top three musical experiences that you've had, and what made them so much fun? Uh, that's impossible to narrow down to three, but I, I will allude to some of them. You know, can I just name a whole bunch of them off the top of my head rather than just three? Because I think it's... <laughs> Tell, uh, name the ones that have good stories. Let's not call them your top. Just say some memorable moments. Well, you, you know... <sighs> okay, bringing Jimmy Rogers into the... And, and touring with him and and making records with him, that was definitely a realization of a long-time dream. Uh, I remember, of course, the first time going to Europe, I played the Marco Fiume uh, Blues Passions Festival. His mother uh, would throw this festival in honor of her son, who had an untimely death. And I was friends with Marco, and uh, they located my information from his laptop and they contacted me to play in Europe for the first time. And I went there and had Big Pete Pearson and Chris James and uh, Brian Fahey and Paul Thomas and Lisa Ote. We had a scrappy little unrehearsed blues band that had so much spirit, but we just went there and we rocked the place and that led to all sorts of other things. But having going to Europe and winning an audience over there was great. And then a few years later, I got to play the Lucerne Blues Festival, which is like one of the the, the greatest blues festivals ever. And just being over there, um, I, we had more of a regular band, Chris James and and uh, Big Pete. And at that point in time, uh, Bob Margolin joined us. That was the first time I ever toured, uh, you know, played overseas with Bob, but Bob was available and up for the gig. And so we went in and here we were playing to some of the, the creme de la creme of the blues. And we went up there and we held our own and everybody had to acknowledge us. You know, the band. That's awesome. But how do we follow that? You know, because we just went there and, you know, I've always played with a lot of passion and been around players who have played with a lot of passion. We just poured it out and the audience just sucked it all in. Sometimes there's that thing that happens with an audience where it's, it's kind of this circular thing that happens where you're giving everything you have and the audience is taking it in and they're giving it back to you. And it's like a circular thing that happens and it just takes you to a place where whoever you were becomes greater than that because of this experience. You're like sharing yourself with your audience, your soul with the audience, and they're loving that and they're giving you acceptance and then you're able to share it even more. And that's a very empowering thing. So. I remember really finding that as like a, this moment of epiphany where you just, oh, okay, here we are. This is, this is it. And, you know, and you, you know, you go after that ever since, you know, I've always looked for that and try and create that sometimes more successfully than others. It's, it's sure. variables in that equation, but, oh God, there's so many, you know, wonderful times. I remember the first time I played at the King Biscuit Blues Festival at the invitation of uh, Louisiana Red, and here I was in the Deep South, and I'm passing by, uh, you know, in Chicago, I'm just friends with all these different artists. So I'm uh, like, okay, Bahalia, Mississippi, that's where Lewis and Dave Myers are from. Horn Lake, Mississippi, that's where, you know, that's where Big Walter Horton's from. Um, you know, Friars Point, oh, I love that song by Robert Nighthawk. You know, I'm, seeing, I'm right here in the the heart of all the stuff, but I felt like I already knew it in a weird way because Chicago was just like such a, uh, a place where people from Mississippi went. So I, uh, and all of a sudden I'm here with Louisiana Red playing in the deep South and I'm feeling all the spirits of all the history of that town, the Sonny Boy Williamson's and the, the, the great artists that, that were from that region. And I'm playing it and it's going over so well. We're just playing the most raw down home stuff possibly imagined. And everybody was just in love with it. And and I'm here with Louisiana Red, who to me was like a family member. And and he's sharing this 
this perch with me that he had and I'm and I'm loving it. And, you know, Red and I had played had played so much together. And Red sometimes would go out and into guitar space and I would just step out, but I'd know exactly when he was coming back in on a turnaround, he'd do like a little wind up or a setup for it and I would just join him right there. And people are like, How did you know to come in there? How did you know to do that? I go, I just been with Red, we lived together. I I know inherently what he's where he's going to go with this stuff. So that was a, another really powerful experience. Oh, boy, I mean, just so many times. I have a great Bo Diddley story. You know, Bo. Yeah, man. Bo Diddley uh, used to uh, used to uh, come into town and need a pickup band, and the promoter always used to call me for the job. So I've got to play Bo Diddley many times. So uh, you know, one time uh, we're playing. We just got through with this famous fifteen twenty minute rehearsal, you know, just he wants to check out the band, make sure that we can follow his cues. And uh, so um, they're letting people in and uh, I go to Bo and I say, uh, so should we call you up with a shuffle in G like we did the last time? And all of a sudden, somebody who looked like Bo, who I thought was Bo, says, well, apparently you don't know Bo. This is at the Bo Knows time, you know. So uh, yeah, yeah. That, that commercial of Bo Knows with the... With sure. Athletic Bo Jackson, yeah, but anyway, yeah, uh, I look and it's a guy dressed perfectly like Bo Diddley. I would, I, he had me fooled, you know. So, anyway, later on, I'm up on the uh, on stage left, left side of stage. Bo is right over here towards the center, and over on my side of stage is this, this Bo Diddley clone, the fake Bo Diddley. And the Bobot, you know, where he basically like scratches the guitar and then moves like he's some sort of creaky mechanical version of himself. And he's sitting there looking at the fake Bo Diddley, who's right below. And I'm right in the middle of this. And here's Bo Diddley doing the fake Bobot, the, the, doing the real Bo Diddley. And here's the fake Bo Diddley looking at it. And I go, this is like the strangest, you know, you can't. <laughs> This like okay yeah you can't make that up <laughs> weird and so surrealistic but cool I, that was i think it's kind of a good story i don't know yeah that is kind of cool man to have that that's great i don't know stuff like this you know i'm just just all these different things that happen you know just wonderful meals on the road you know just times where you go and you get to share the culture of a different country and they they have a night off and they have you over for a home-cooked meal and you have all this beautiful french food at this this old castle that's their home. Like, wow, this is really life, you know? So You know what? I had uh Tommy Castro on the show and he said the same thing. He goes, You go there, it's like exactly what you said. It's like they the the, the, the pub owners or the you know, the venue owners, they bring you back and they make it's like they're cooking you a meal in their house. Oh they are. That is amazing. They're offering you the best they have to offer and you're taking this in and going, ah. Oh. You know how lucky am I to be a part of this cultural exchange? You know, yeah, you have they love, and what they have we love. You know, I mean, it's right thing. So um, great times, great so many great times. You know, Bob Margol and I just uh, played in Switzerland. We did uh, a five day run at uh, Marion's Jazz Room, which is a cool jazz club. And we did it just as a duet. And it was the second time we had done it, and they requested the same thing back again. Uh, and we did right before oh, nice. the, the COVID shutdown, and then they, they had us back. And so it was really wonderful. And so uh, there's an older gentleman that came up, and he was so happy and enthusiastic, and he's saying these things in Swiss German, which I couldn't understand. So the manager comes up, and he says, um, he doesn't speak English and he doesn't have a word for harmonica, but he says he loves the way that I play the mouth violin. <laughs> That's cool, man. Mouth, That's cool. Made me so happy. So either, the mouth violin. So, Craig, either the harmonica has been elevated to violin status or violins have been downgraded to low. <laughs> the mouth violin. That's funny how, pe funny how people express it when they don't have a word for it, isn't it? Yeah, and, you know... When, it's interesting. It's a really toneful experience, you know, because there's a lot of space when you're doing it. And so there's things that we do that are just pure tone and, and texture and things like that. And so when people hear that, they're not used to hearing those sounds from a harmonica. And hmm. I've had this now for well over 50 years, and I'm just, you know, 
I I know my way around the instrument and its tone. So it's people hear it and sometimes they're like, should that sound be coming out of that instrument? And they go, okay. Yeah. But it it was very gratifying to be called the mouth violin. The mouth violin. Yeah, man. Now, Bob, Bob is Margolin. Isn't he own this tone or isn't he part of this tone or something like that? But yeah, before any of that, we were friends. Now, the first time I saw him was when Muddy Waters played my high school gymnasium. So everything goes. That's through. wild. And then um, it wasn't until years later that I was hired to work with him. The president of Phoenix Blues Society put together this tribute to Muddy Waters and Holland Wolf. And so they had Bob Margolin and they had the Chico Chisholm band, Chico Chisholm being Holland Wolf's last drummer. And it was the first time I got a chance to play with Bob and he was down with it, you know. And so. From that point forward, every time that we were in the same vicinity, he'd always call me up to play some, you know. And next thing you know, um, I hired him, he hired me, and we're, we're playing all around together. And then we formed this little thing with Bob Strozier, and the three of us are the Bobs of the Blues. So, That's so funny. Yeah. And, and we're all uniquely qualified for that job. <laughs> That's great. Sometimes Ken- the Bobs of the Blues. And we call him... Kenny Bob. Hey, give me your top three Desert Island discs. In no particular order, just for this moment. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, Muddy Waters Sail On, Little Walter, yeah. Here You Go, Jimmy Rogers, Chicago Mom. Very cool. That was no problem. <laughs> I know. Usually people struggle with that one more than any other question that I, I will ever ask. Those uh, um, all albums I bought in high school, too, that formed me. But to this day, they're still my favorite record. Mm hmm. Mine are the same, high school age. Tell me, what's the, what's the most important lessons you've learned from getting older? Well, there's a finite bit of time that we have on this earth. Um, but I think also to, to, to move in the direction of, of positivity and, and, you know, to, to, to have your own self-respect and to, 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 only go in the places where you would receive that back, you know, and to offer it to everybody else too. So th- I think that's, that's part of it. I think, you know, it's tough getting older because where, when I started out as a student of the music, I looked to the older generation to give me the attaboys. And now I'm the older generation. Yeah. So, but what is kind of gratifying is you know, I'll do, harmonica workshops at the IBCs. I've done that for the last five years, I believe. And I get people that come in and they're really moved by the philosophies I have. And I don't present myself as the best because I don't think anybody's the best. It's like, sure. Yeah. There's apples and there's oranges, you know, but I'm the best Bob Corator. There's none better than me at being me, but right. You know, so I try and instill that in other people too, that they should, find within themselves and and i give different philosophies and i give certain techniques and things like that and people have said they've been very moved by that harmonica players who are of a younger generation will come and say that they um they've been very influenced by my work and that's a really powerful thing when i yeah that is when i have been listed among people's influences or, or favorite harmonica players that means a lot to me so i mean i still am that hardworking guy that, you know, works hard to pay bills and does this. I, I've, I've been able to have a measure of success, but I don't know. I mean, nobody's going to get rich off this. So, I mean, it keeps you humble. It keeps you real. Mm. I don't know if I would want it any other way because if you don't have to work and, and, and struggle for something, is it really does it have the same value to you if it just gets handed to you. Totally get that. No, but what I'm saying is I still work hard and and I'm just trying to keep everything together. It's a constant balancing act of finances and energy. So I've gotten a little better at it. I'm very focused. I'm very uh Yeah, you are, man. You're super focused. So I guess those are the lessons that you learn, you know. What's the best decision you ever made? <sighs> Well, I, I think the best decision I ever made was to pursue music as a life and that we went through a little bit when I had to come to the reckoning with my parents and and, and do that. But that made everything else easy. Everything else kind of fell into place. 
I think some other decisions. When I eventually bought the rhythm room from the owner, that was good, but it was tough because right after I bought it, uh, September 11th, 2001 happened. And holy crap, I wondered if I was going to even be able to make it. And it took a year and a half wow. for the world to get their head wrapped around it right where they could go back out and celebrate life. So, I mean, that was uh, tough. But I think, Yeah, that's baptism by fire, man. That's a oof. But, but buying yeah. a I think, was a good thing overall, you know. So Yeah. So that, that, was, that was good. Um, I don't know. Just uh, – I just, I just try and – be real, you know, and, and that that's the lesson that you learn, you know, the more that you can be real about everything, the, the better opportunity you have to to um, succeed with what you have to work with, you know. So uh, you had mentioned earlier, I'm a non-singing harmonica player. And I think that what's kind of cool about that is that I, I get to have uh, the opportunities that most people don't. If you're a singer, you've got your voice that you need to make happen. And so if you're going to put out album after album, you have to really add variety. But because I'm not, I can create all these really fun assignments. I can record one day with John Primer, one day with Bob Margolin, another day with Francine Reed, another day with Thornetta Davis, and uh, another day with uh, Willie Buck. And, and all of these create different aspects of my own playing and a different experience for the listener. So I think that uh, taking a, a, what might be called a disadvantage and looking at it as an advantage has created this wonderful little template for myself to be able to do records year after year and have each one be their own story that would be a completely different listening experience than the one before it because it would, you know, like uh, this woman anthology, women blues, showcase is different than uh, Jimmy Primetime Smith Bob Corator World in the Jug record that came out and the Chicago record will be completely different oh, hold on a second all good it's you're back low power mode so I don't think we got a lot of time left here um, but but props to you for coming up with this idea because I mean there's a lot of creativity in there that you know hey why don't you know it's like you made something out of nothing I would say is, it's out of nothing because I am offering production and harmonica. No, I mean, you made, you just said, hey, man, let me just create this series of records. And, you know, this didn't exist before. And you took the tools you had and what was available and you created it. I thought it was pretty, pretty clever. Works for me, you know, and it, yeah. and, it, and it, it, I maintain my values, you know, and many of these albums are uh, celebrations of, of the, the black voice, you know, just beautiful. And, and I've always found that that is an inspiration to me to hear the reflections of a Southern black voice and to use some of that same, um, same uh, diction in my harmonica playing. So just having that is something that I've always fed off of. So, but yeah, as I go on, I'm, I've, I've become more, uh, comfortable producing things that may be a little bit outside of just the Chicago blues thing. And this next record that I'll have coming out is an album called uh, somebody put bad luck on me. Yeah. I've got a couple of yep. there that are just beautiful and have a lot of changes and I've found real nice harmonica parts to add to them. You put that in with some heavy Chicago blues or some nice down home blues. And you got this interesting package that will take you to a whole bunch of different places. So uh, but again, I think it all comes from a place of, 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 of a soulful performance. So I'm looking forward to hearing that last question. Tell me the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years. And has that change been intentional or just a natural part of aging? Um, 10 years. Can we go back to 20 maybe? Yeah, if you want, of course. I think basically I've gotten more confident in who I am. I understand my place. In all of this, I think that uh, when when I first started out, you know, we all dealt with certain indignities of, of not being respected or included in certain things, and um, I've been able to either not sign up for that kind of thing or just move past it to go to my own places where I'm accepted. I go to where I'm accepted. And I'm I find a lot of love in a lot of different places and 
uh, and a big following of what I'm doing. I mean, it's just small in the bigger picture, but I've got wherever I go, whenever I put out an album, there's people that just seem to love those releases. I'm very proud of all that. But uh, I've learned not to, um, you know, at a point in time, I felt like I had to deal with some of the um, indignities or the disrespect that would come around with somebody of my generation where maybe I'm not worthy of some of the opportunities I've had. And I'm like, well, no, I, I've worked my whole life at this. If I'm not, yeah. then what am I, you know? And, and then why did you, why did it come in your lap? Who are you? It, it, you know, yeah. Who are you to judge me? And would Henry Gray have something different to say about that? Or John Primer have right. to say about that? Which they would. You know, so what I'm saying is uh, uh, sometimes you, you, you see that. And then at a point in time, you're like, I'm not going to stand for that. I, I'm just, Good. if somebody, somebody is not treating me right, then I'll identify that to them and, and we'll go, we'll move in other directions. Not a problem. So, I mean, doing that has freed me from a lot of, a lot of uh, what I once had to go through as I was trying Good. to build, you know, build a place for myself in this. So, um, and, you know, at this point, I, I've done most of what I want to do. I'm sure there's more adventures and I continue to find new projects and new things that I'm able to do that are, are still artful and exciting and inspirational. But, um, but I'm not looking to prove myself to anybody. I don't know if I have to, if somebody, if I haven't proved myself now, then I've never going to by their standards, but I have to go by my standards. And I, I hold a pretty high standard for myself. I feel. Absolutely, man. So, well, hey, let me tell people, first of all, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being so open and sharing some really cool stories. And thanks for coming on the show. And uh, I would really love to have people check out Bob's music, Bob Corator. See, uh, his website is Bob Corator, Bob, C-O-R-R-I-T-O-R-E dot com. Uh, he's a hell of a guitar. I'm uh, sorry. He's a hell of a harmonica player. Spoken uh, the vault. Player. <laughs> what's that? Spoken. What, what's that? Guitar player. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That uh his his vault series is very cool. I went through three or four of the albums. It's really cool to have all these different artists on there and it comes out really nice. If if you love the blues, you gotta check it out. Uh there's nine albums in the vault series. Also, make sure uh if you're interested in checking out Bob's radio show on Sunday nights, Phoenix time, that's Mountain Standard Time from six PM to eleven PM. Please check them out on kjzz.org, kjzz.org. And also, um, he's got six, he'll be in uh, Europe and the rest of the world six more times alone this year. And you can find all his touring again on bobcorridor.com. Uh, subscribe to his newsletter. He's got a really cool newsletter that he puts out periodically. So just go to bobcorridor.com, enter your email address, and check him out on Facebook. He posts a lot of stuff on Facebook as well. Uh, anything else? Any final words of wisdom? Anything else you'd like to promote or anything else I can support in any way? Uh, well, I'm really proud that John Primer will be inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame. Yes. I'm hoping that we can get Bob Strozier in there at age 92. He certainly has earned his strike. So that's uh, a project for upcoming. Um, I, I was personally involved in helping Henry Gray in there. So I, I don't know. I just uh, let's just continue on with this path. Let's honor where we came from, where the blues came from. Let's uh, understand how beautiful and sacred it is. How it's such a hard-earned culture that's created it, and it's, that's something to be respected and held up and honored and uh, and let's just carry on and do the best we can with uh, with uh, with a positive agenda that's what I, I hope for for all of us right on i agree with you i think it's great hold on one second bob thanks for everything uh, hold on we'll wrap up everybody thank you so much for listening if you enjoy this please share it on your socials with all your friends uh thanks again to bob corridor for spending time with us we really appreciate it and most important remember that happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice. Have fun. Until uh, next time, peace and love, everybody. And I am out. Bob, thanks for everything, brother. Thank you.